So welcome, everybody. Um, this is going to be a slightly new twist to what you have been doing um, and what I have been involved in over the last no, almost 20 years, as, uh, as Leslie suggested. Um, so I'm going to walk you through some things where I would like to invite yours or people in your region's participation in, uh, in, in various projects that we are starting here um, and moving invasive species control efforts. And I'm talking largely about plants, deer, and earthworms in, in, in this concept, uh, context. I'm not talking about invasive forest pests here but moving it into a different direction and hopefully become a little more successful over time. So when, when we think about uh, invasive plant species, we always assume that they are the drivers of ecosystem change. Uh, and then we also assume as managers that if we can control introduced plants that we get some benefits for, uh, for the native species that we care about and that's why we do invasive uh, plant control. The reality, though, is somewhat different. Uh, sometimes plants drive the deter deteriorations, but not always. Uh, very rarely, and that's a very sore point with me sitting here in an academic institution, do we know the benefits or the potential uh, uh, non-target effects? Um, because we don't, we don't uh, assess them. And that has both methodological problems and attitude problems and among the managers or those charged with, uh, with managing areas because they usually say we are too busy to even assess what our methods are creating and whether they are successful or not. Somebody mute there where there's lots of discussion in the background. It is actually a little irritating for me right now. Um, so what that then creates if we, if we don't know whether we are successful or not, and uh, we get invasive species fatigue. Uh, and I'm sure you all know about that from you uh, individually or the groups or the volunteers, uh, do they always come back to just do another poll or are they getting really, really tired? Um, and what what I have seen, not only in New York, but uh, and among funding agencies and other places, we get an endless frustration about the inability to make a difference because we go back to the same organizations, ask for money over and over and over again, and we are like on a hamster mill even if we control one species we can uh, we then move on to the next one. The only time that we can really do make a difference seems to be in biological control because I assume nobody's out there spraying loose strife anymore. Um, the question then is what do we need to be successful? Uh, and the first thing is actually that we need to define success. And I define success as a recovery or retention of native species and their habitats. Uh, the second one is if we can go in and design established conservation landscapes for the species that we care about. If we think about global climate change, what will happen is that a lot of species will move through our landscapes, and our landscapes are not ready to allow that uh, for species to find new places where they can exist under new climate conditions. And the most important thing is we need to know what we want and not just what we do not want. Uh, if we just keep on slashing out the ones that we do not want, we may not have a chance of getting back what we want or establishing goals of what we want. The approach to that um, is something that I call assess severity of different stressors, and I'm going to go into that one with the next slide. We need to refine assessment tools, and that is kind of the talk uh, today. I want to present some ideas that we have and maybe for you to participate in it so you can actually determine whether the plants, the earthworms, or the deer, or something else is actually, in fact, causing the deterioration or the absence of the native plant species that you would like to have in, in, in the areas that you care about or manage. Uh, what that also then allows us to do is set appropriate conditions for recovery. Um, and then we're going to hopefully have something that is more enticing and appealing instead of doing some pulling is actually active implementation uh, which may not involve invasive plant control, but may involve deer hunting or planting of native species or whatever you have. Um, so when we think about our landscapes and what we really have is um, an abundance of species that come in uh, from overseas, uh, whether these are plants, whether these are garlic mustard plants, as you see them up in the slide on top left, whether these are earthworms, whether they're slugs, 
And then over time, we think that uh, native plant species, and I just have two examples here, some charismatic ones that we rarely see anymore, uh, that they decline until they become threatened and endangered, uh, and then legislation kicks in. Uh, but what happened at the same time also is that we have these gigantic increases in deer abundance, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, and when we really look at that is, are the invasive plants more important than the earthworms, than the slugs, or or the deer the overriding factor, which is my pet hypothesis right now. But we really don't know whether we have single most important stressors or the combinations are most important. We're trying to address that with a number of projects that we are involved in right now. But if we would just focus on one of these various threats, we may or may not hit the right, uh, the right target. Um, and we very often do not know. We just assume because we haven't done the assessments to say it's this or that. So the great challenges in, in conservation or something, this is from, from Leopold's land ethic, and the picture is actually from where one of his sons uh, lived in, in Ithaca. We, what we really work in for is understanding and enhancing the capacity for ecosystems self-renewal. Um, so if we can get to that, uh, then we have made a gigantic step forward. But when you look at the landscape that you see on the lower left there, does this landscape really maximize conservation benefits? The simple answer would be saying no, um, because it looks now much more the pauper than it was when Carl and Lynn bought this property some 30 years ago. The question then is, can we tell why it doesn't maximize conservation benefits? Um, and then we have a number of ideas, and you can see through the landscapes and uh, say, well, there's no... There is no forest recovery. We don't have any inter, uh, native plants on the, in the forest understory. And I can tell you that the deer are rampant in there um, and that there are earthworms all over the place. Uh, but we don't know whether maybe acid rain, nutrient addition, something else, climate change may have, may have hit as well. Uh, and just because we have these other factors that we can still see, uh, are they really the causal factors for the absence of native plant species and seedlings that you should see on the ground? We don't know by just looking at a system. We need to do a little, little more. So what I'm proposing is the development of a new assessment tool. I'm just calling it a tool right now. Uh, maybe we find a, a better and uh, more appealing word for that. But what I propose is use of native sentinel plants basically canaries in the coal mine uh, kind of uh, uh, approach. And that involves deliberate planting into different backgrounds. If you're really interested whether your, your orchid or any other plant can still live in the existence of earthworms, maybe the best way of assessing that is to put it into that background instead of assuming that the earthworms drove it out. Uh, and we can assess the backgrounds and, or areas where we have introduced plants, uh, where we have worm invasions, where we do plant control, when we do chemical control, weeding, or biological control, does that actually set the stage for native plant species to grow in those areas or not? And if we don't find them there, why is the reason after control that we do not find them there? Is it because we don't have any seeds to propagate uh, or to repopulate? Then we may need to bring in some, some species. Or there are other reasons that the habitat has just so... Uh, deteriorated that native plant species can't grow there anymore. Uh, and if we uh, uh, then find certain ways um, that certain habitats can or cannot uh, um, be present in these areas or grow in there, we can manipulate the absence or presence of a stressor, uh, for example, deer, uh, through exclusion or um, trying to reduce deer numbers if we want to alleviate that stress. The benefits of an approach like that is really information about whether species that we would like in this habitat can still occupy that habitat that appears so deteriorated. Uh, it would be a direct assessment of a potential impact, for example, worms or plants. Uh, and it's an easy methodology. It's suitable for volunteer participation. Um, and they all can pull plants, but they also can maybe plant plants. Uh, I know we have a lot of gardeners that uh, come and help us in, in some of our, our efforts, so we can harness them in some of the uh, assessment methods, and they can do it in their backyards or they can do it in management areas wherever, wherever the uh, assessment methods may need to be done. 
Um, I'm going to give you an example why we came in, in, in my group to embrace this approach. Um, we have for a long time tried to look at what plant species are doing in our wetlands and in our forests, and we call that impact assessments. And I had a student join my, my group a few years ago, Brian Green, who said, we are all wrong. It's not the plants that drive this. It's changes in hydrology, urbanization, or other things. And Brian worked with Privet, Ligustrum sinens, and riparian, and riparian Forest of South Carolina. And the general dogma was that the rapidly urban, uh, urbanizing areas in the southeast would change the hydrology of these small riparian areas and the streams, create different hydro periods, and that basically eliminates the ability of native plant species to grow in those areas and favors privet. And what people had done before was go in and look at land cover, um, urbanization gradients, and uh, where you can find uh, privet. And what you usually see, and that's also what, uh, what Brian found by looking at uh, 15 different uh, riparian areas in South Carolina, is as development increases, privet increases. Um, and that's the top panel. It doesn't say uh, uh, urbanization increase, but that's what you see there. And as then in the lower panel on the left is as privet increases, native plant cover decreases. So now you can make that link and say the decrease in native plant cover is a function of increased urban development. Um, so we tried to assess that a little more, and we planted native seedlings inside and outside of privet um, uh, thickets, and that's what you see on the two right-hand panels. Just two species, Casmantium is river oats, and Ace and is box elder, so a tree and a grass, very typical species in these floodplain forests. And if you, this is survival over like a 60-week period, so a year, year and a half. Um, if you really look at that, you can see that if seedlings are grown under privet, they really have a greatly reduced survival rate compared to just immediately adjacent in the same floodplain, but outside a privet thicket. So that's something that you, uh, that you can anticipate and you can say, okay, privet drives the decline of these native species of a, of a grass and the tree. So the question then is whether we can find that in, uh, uh, in the various watersheds that show different development. And I know this slide is a little busy here, but I will try to walk you through it. So the top graph shows a gradient in development, basically urbanization. Uh, and we grouped the, uh, the 12 different, um, I'm sorry, this, these are data from the, from the 12 different sites that Brian worked at, and we had four different species. These are the abbreviation, AC is Ace and Agundo. Uh, the next one is Allium, then it's Casmantium, and then there is a Privet. And we looked at their survival over a gradient of development. And what you can see is that the growth of these native plant species, with the exception of privet, um, is not related to development. These species can exist under all kinds of development and changes in hydro period. All species can grow everywhere. The thing, though, is that the sites, so there is no signal of development in the performance of the species. I'm just showing you survival. But if you look at the sites, uh, these different color lines in the two lower panels, uh, are the different sites that Brian worked at. Uh, different sites have very, very different abilities to allow species, whether it's Asa Nagundo or the river oats again, to grow in these sites. So there's variation in among sites, but it is not related to the development. So what we now know from the privet example is that, yes, there's all kinds of development going on in the, in the southeast that changes all kinds of things, but it doesn't cause the demise of uh, floodplain species that are native. Uh, it's privet that dries them out, um, and so that uh, creates all kinds of uh, abilities to really go after an invasive species here, and you would see a benefit to native species, but only if these species can get there. So in a lot of places, uh, the propagules for uh, uh, seeds or, or, or rhizome pieces 
may not be available to colonize areas that have lost the native species. So we need to bring them back in there, but the sites are ready to receive them, even though uh, uh, the areas are further and further developed. So there is a lot of hope in terms of conservation of these areas. The second example, uh, something that you are all familiar with, comes from our garlic mustard monitoring, and we have done that over well over a decade now. And we used to do this. This is the Vicky Newsletter measuring some garlic mustard um, <clears throat> in the field, basically in preparation for introduction of biocontrol insects that we uh, th that we were hoping to uh, to release. And we had permanent plots. We measured them. We measured various factors, including stem height. I'm going to uh, give you some examples that we have collected from different sites over the last few years. Uh, and we didn't do anything to these sites. We just allowed them, and we measured basically to see what kind of fluctuations there are in abundance. And I'm showing you adult densities right now. Um, that's from our long-term monitoring. You see we on the left uh, side we have a number of sites. And what you can see is the number of stems per permanent quadrant, which is a half a square meter. Um, there's Fermi Lab there, there's West Point, there's Carlin and Leopold's property in yellow, and Hall Woods is another site in Illinois. And what you can see is that garlic mustard disappears from all the sites. Uh, we had a number of volunteers collect information in, uh, uh, in other areas, and these are on the right side panel, these are sites from the Midwest and also in the, in the Northeast, and yes, we see all kinds of fluctuations, but over time, we will see the disappearance of garlic mustard if you do not do anything. That seems to hold for all sites. These sites were established in high areas of garlic mustard abundance, which was considered ideal for insect releases. Um, we don't know how, these how long these populations were there. Um, but we know that over maybe a decade or two decades, at all sites that we have looked at, garlic mustard disappears if you don't do anything. Um, I know we have the mechanism down right now. Garlic mustard builds up uh, uh, negative soil feedback. It's some kind of an organism that builds up in the soil. If you go in, if you spray, if you pull, if you do anything, garlic mustard comes back with a vengeance. If you don't do anything, garlic mustard disappears. So we're trying to write this up right now. Uh, so stop all activities of pulling garlic mustard. Garlic mustard goes away by itself. And contrary to some uh, results that you can find in the literature, which are largely pot experiments, um, we have seen, I don't know whether the coexistence is happy between garlic mustard and a lot of the native plant species, but we have long-term research sites where garlic mustard does not expand at all. It stays in those areas. We also know that earthworms need to be there first before garlic mustard can invade. Uh, and trilliums, geranium, other plant species are really not threatened by garlic mustard. They just coexist. This is Fillmore Glen State Park, but we have similar uh, shots from many other places. So we do not see negative effects of garlic mustard, even long-term residents on other native species in the field. Um, we will do some more tests. Native species can grow even in places where garlic mustard uh, is unable to grow any longer. You will see germination and some small seedlings uh, uh, show up, uh, but they never make it into the adult stage. So, all right, so putting these different things together and getting into the deer situation was also, um, this is a work from uh, Vicky Nuzo in Fermilab in Illinois. Uh, where garlic mustard is represented in this graph as the black bars. Um, she was called in to do a study uh, to look at uh, spring wildflower displays that were see seemingly threatened by overabundant deer. In 1998, there was a 90% deer herd reduction by sharpshooters, and you can see that the cover of native plants in yellow uh, greatly increased to, uh, to 80%. At the same time, garlic mustard increased as well because it was just colonizing the area. It started there in 1992, but then it's also on the decline and that it has largely disappeared out of the areas. So garlic mustard didn't prevent anything in terms of native vegetation return. It was just there kind of blending in, and the deer were the big important factor. I tell most of you nothing particularly new. But it's interesting to see that deer are the overriding factor, and garlic mustard does not really do much to that system. 
Here's just a, a result again from Fermilab showing that the, uh, uh, this is the result of, uh, of exclusion that was then resulting in 1998 in the culling of the deer herd. Um, the plants that were fenced greatly increased in height um, and also started flowering, whereas before and the ones that were further exposed to deer herd delivery just never flowered. And trilliums need to reach about 18 centimeter in height before they actually start flowering. So when we go back and take a look on historic deer abundance, um, this is just some information from Wisconsin where people went out in the 1940s and assessed that 60 years ago, uh, deer abundance was already incredibly high below uh, desirable stocking rates. The only exception in Wisconsin was the Menominee Indian Reservation where year-round hunting where less than 10% of seedlings were damaged and they have a flourishing forestry industry. Uh, and Troy can talk about if he desires to on the new TNC report about deer impacts in New York. The forest regeneration is inadequate for 32% of the states uh, based on the what it was at Troy, 1,600 uh, places where that was assessed, uh, locations in New York. But this was looking at forest regeneration and tree regeneration. There's no information in this report about understory species. If we can't even get the trees back, a lot of the species that are much more palatable and desired by deer are probably under much, much heavier pressure. Um, and this is some more <laughs> info from Aldo. It's kind of interesting to look back what he was saying in the 30s and 40s. Uh, I'm more interested in the second two points here that grazing, and that was largely coming out of the southwest but and for, for cattle, but also elk uh, and deer, has done more damage to land and forest fires and cutting as severe as they may be. Uh, and more into our areas here in the 1900s, about one deer was killed per five square miles uh, in Vermont, Maine, Michigan, and New York. Now we have abundances of 40 to uh, well over 100 per square mile, and obviously we shoot about 40 to 60 percent of them, but that that just means for our area that we had a chronic overabundance of deer for decades, which has uh, have emptied the landscape of most desirable plant species and the most palatable plant species, and we will suffer from that legacy. Invasive plants, earthworms, or so occur locally. Deer are everywhere. So what we are proposing then here, and I'm going to go into some details, is a sentinel uh, approach. We are spearheaded that here with tests in some 40 locations right now. There's a bunch of them in, at uh, West Point where we have some, some large uh, experiments going on. We work here uh, in support of the Cornell Deer Program where they have uh, areas of sterilization, hunting, and control to see whether the various methods do anything to deer feeding pressure. We work with the Finger Lakes Land Trust. Uh, we work with state parks and private landowners to assess what the deer browse intensity is on their lands. And we use oaks, largely red oaks, but we will do some other species as well. I have a new graduate student who just started, Anise Dobson, who will be part of these assessment protocols, and we will do more than just oaks. These oaks are grown from seeds, so you have local genotypes. Uh, we plant them in the spring, we protect half of them from herbivory, and then we measure their performance. Um, and we look at survival growth, herbivory and a couple of other factors that I don't need to go into. The outcome of these exercises then is uh, we can assess whether a species can grow and survive in a particular environment. And we don't care, but we record whether there are earthworms in, uh, in some of these forests, um, whether we plant oaks directly into garlic mustard or other places. We've done so with other species that we try to restore some native and endangered ones. Uh, and uh, so this is an approach, regardless of the species, that you can utilize in your area, depending on what you care most about. But oaks are uh, really easy. Uh, and my presentation here is to tell you that if you want to participate in some of these activities, we will have a workshop uh, next spring to do this. But the time here is now to collect seeds. Uh, acorns are falling all over the place. Uh, asters will produce copious amounts of flowers. You may still have some spring wildflowers uh, that you need to, uh, that you that you can get. Uh, and uh, be opportunistic of what you have in your areas. Store the seeds um, and, uh, and stratify them. Um, and uh, 
maybe work with species that are locally of, uh, of concern for you. Um, we need species that can grow relatively quickly, so things like trilliums and others that have extended dormancies will not work very well. Uh, I discourage buying things from somewhere. You need to be really aware that you do not introduce earthworms through your plantings into some areas, um, and I can talk more about that maybe at the workshop. But if you are interested to in, in participating in that, um, just send me a note. There's my email. Most of you will, you will have that. We have standardized protocols that are in develop, uh, development. Uh, you can select study sites wherever you are interested in what you want to assess, whether it's an invasive plant, whether it's an earthworm invasion, whether it's anything else, um, and you can plant these things out. Uh, and then we will uh, determine a time uh, for a spring course here at Cornell, depending on how many people would like to participate. What you will need just in terms of, uh, of resources is uh, obviously places for assessment. Um, and that varies depending on where you are. Seeds of species for assessment. And then some, uh, we use containers, just what you saw where the little seedling was in, because that seems to be really a nice way of, of growing them, and you can store a whole bunch in some trays. Uh, or other seedling containers. Again, make sure that you don't have earthworms in them as you're transporting them around. You need some help from volunteers or within your organization. And you need some fencing material. I'm going to show you one example right now, What we just for exclusion of deer. So we fence seedling individually, seedlings individually, and we use hardware mesh. Uh, you can also use deer fence or any other uh, means that you have uh, available. We need labels for marking individuals and some time for repeat visits through the, through the spring, summer, fall, and then we obviously uh, um, don't do anything over the winter and then look at winter browse uh, uh, and the incidences of that uh, in early spring. Uh, and here are some examples of what we have done. You kind of see in the center a cage, and the oak uh, is doing really, really well. Uh, one that's not caged, and you see that on the upper left-hand corner here, um, that was uh, partially eaten. There's just one leaf left. You can see that we mark our seedlings individually with a tag. We also use uh, GPS locations. And then we have just two graphics from two locations here um, around Cornell where we look at the survival of protected and unprotected oak seedlings. And these are in forests. Um, and you can see we plant 20 seedlings at each site uh, that are protected and 20 seedlings that are unprotected. So it's not uh, a gigantic effort. Uh, we don't plant them in grids. We do little transects, uh, meandering transects to two places, depending on, on site conditions. And you can see that within uh, two months of planting, uh, on the left side, a lot of the oaks have just simply uh, have been browsed, and most of them die when they're not fenced. The fenced ones, we very rarely lose anybody, and very often they also grow. So uh, here is a way of, uh, if we lose seedlings that are less than a foot tall already uh, to deer browse, that just means we will never have any oak regeneration in the forest that are under this high deer pressure. We will do this with lots of other uh, plant species because what we figured out in some places we don't lose any oaks, but we still lose well over 15 to 20 percent of the trilliums. So we've ex experimented with a couple of other species. Oaks will only get us that far. If any oak is being eaten within its first year of growth anywhere, means you have too many deer. Um, and uh, it's a very sobering assessment of what we see in places around here, whether these places are under protection in state parks or whether they're, they're part of the Finger Lakes uh, land trust areas. So what I'm suggesting is that we can actually create conservation landscapes and don't have things show up and look like the picture on the upper left, but through active uh, plantings and protection, for example, from, from deer herbivory, we can create landscapes that may not look immediately like the one on the right at Silmore Glen State Park, um, but uh, uh, we can probably get a lot of our landscape back to something that looks more like the stuff on the right and not like the ones on the left. Uh, what that does uh, through active participation and involvement, hopefully you have more fun than just pulling out the species that you do not want if we do active restoration. 
Um, we need to change the discourse. That's what I'm more and more convinced of. Uh, we need to know what the stresses are, not just focus on the invaders. But uh, um, if the plants grow fine in earthworm-infested uh, areas like the trilliums that actually in the picture before, uh, we don't need to worry about the earthworms. Uh, maybe we need to really, really change the discourse about their management. Um, we need to promote the management of the most important stressor and not just focus on stuff that we can easily deal with. Or maybe it's not so easy to deal even with plants. Know what you want in the landscape. Do not focus on origin. That's a very, very poor predictor uh, of uh, what the most uh, important stressors are. Through these efforts, I think, through assessment, you will a lot of people will real, realize how important deer are as t transformative factors in the landscape. If you can harness some of that energy and pride in creating landscapes and replanting, you may need to fence these areas. I hope that we can create a renewed ownership in the areas that are under our responsibility, and we are basically responsible for the deer increases that we have seen. Waiting for someone or something to change or take action, I do not think is any longer an option. We need to become uh, more active but doing the right thing. Uh, and in the meantime, as a start, you can do things like this. Um, and uh, so I think every botanist, ecologist, or conservationist should feed her family with locally raised gourmet venison and just imagine how low the carbon footprint is. And while deer are all over the place, invasive plants are very, very local. Uh, and you will get a bigger bang for your buck uh, if you were to focus on the most important stressor, which at this point in our landscape I consider to be deer. That's what I had to say. <laughs>